The Endless Step by Esther Houtzig, Chapter 17 When the announcement was made in school that there was to be a declamation contest the following August, the devil, or the ham in me, prodded me into entering it. Raisa Niknovna gave out a list of works from which the students were to make their selections. As usual, there were the poems about the glories of the Soviet Union and the Stakhanovov workers, odes to Stalin, to the Russian soldiers, and a sonnet or two to the Soviet people. And way down the bottom of the list, as if it were a frivolous afterthought, not to be taken too seriously, was Pushkin's Eugene Anjan. I loved Anjan. I loved it for taking me from my harsh exile back to a time and place I never knew, to its lost world. In the past two years, Raisa Niknovna had not become any friendlier. <clears throat> On the contrary, she seemed to have interred herself into a cake of ice. She, among all my teachers, still made me feel like an outsider, and with her my Polish accent was always at its heaviest. I hated having to ask her for permission to enter the contest. "'You wish to recite an ode to our great leader Stalin?' she asked, her face smooth as ice and her voice sharp with sarcasm. She had a point, of course. I confessed that with her kind permission, I would like to attempt Tatiana's dream from Eugene Anjan. A frown cracked the ice. Clearly, Raiza Niknovna thought it inappropriate for a Polish deportee to have the honor of entering a Soviet declamation contest, no matter what she declaimed. Um, it should be noted that a declamation contest is where you are reciting works from famous authors, in case you hadn't already figured that out. Are you aware that there are to be no prizes, she asked, reducing me to some greedy little monster. Grandmother was more explicit. Anti-Semite, she cried. That's somebody who is anti-Jewish. If I had any sense, I would have given up then, but I came from a long line of stubborn idiots. So I began to study Tatiana's dream as if I were preparing for a performance at the Bolshoi Theater. Tatiana is a shy country girl who falls in love with a worldly man from St. Petersburg society, Eugene Anjan. Her terrifying dream foreshadows the tragic future of her love. It was my objective that Tatiana and I become one, nothing less. So I memorized, recited, read, performed in front of anyone who cared or did not care to listen. I tried out every nuance of speech, worked on every word. No one escaped my histrionics, my friends, mother's friends, not even a hawk soaring over the des deserted steppe. An awesome dream, Tatiana's dreaming, the hundredth, the two hundredth time. Even my poor grandmother began to wilt when she came to visit us. Beautiful, beautiful, she said, but so frightening, the bear and the wood and those freaks. Esther, darling, such a marvelous actress you are. You're frightening your poor grandmother. You better stop, darling. Would Sarah Bernhardt have stopped? I went on and on through that spring, at Yosef Isayevich's being Tatiana with her dream and her great sad love for Eugene Anjan. Late in the spring, I was temporarily interrupted. Life at Yosef Isayevich's had been pleasant, comparatively speaking. Letters from father were reassuring, and when it was planting time, when we were to be assigned a piece of barren soil to struggle with, Yosef Isayevich told us that we need not worry about potatoes, that more than likely we would be spending another winter with him, and if not, he would help us out. But Yosef Isayevich's wife returned much sooner than expected, and the hunt was on again. After the usual difficulties, we ended up back in the village with a young couple and a baby. Their mud hut had one room and a kitchen, which kind-hearted Yosef Isayevich arranged to have divided in half, giving mother and me a tiny place to sleep. So tiny there was only one room, enough for a narrow bed and for one person. Mother. Squeezed between my shiffer robe and the wall was a small blanket chest for me to sleep on. It was too short for me to stretch out full length. When I did so, I put my feet on the wall in the beauty position. But since the chest back to the stove on the other side of the wall, it would be a lovely foot warmer in the winter. Once we settled into our new hut, it was the young couple, Natasha and Nikolay and the little baby, Katya, who became my best audience. 
An awesome dream, Tatiana's dreaming, I recited. The baby thought I was absolutely splendid. Nervous and excited in equal parts, I spent the whole night before the declamation contest awake in my cramped bed. Feet higher than my head, belly caved in, I swung from the exalted moment when my ears would ring with the shouts of Bravo! Shouts that would eventually lead me to the stages of Moscow, Leningrad, Warsaw, and New York down to the ghastly moment when I would stand up in the school auditorium, the victim of total amnesia. So what she think it's going to be? She's going to be greatly wonderful, or she's going to forget what she has to say. That August was hot, sometimes so hot that our cozy little corner in Natasha and Nikolay's hut made me feel as if we were buried alive in a bed of steaming manure. As soon as morning came, I crept out for a breath of fresh air before the others awakened. The dew was lifting from the parched steppe, shrouding the huts of the village. I knew it was going to be another scorcher, but who cared about the heat? Who cared about anything but the contest? And what was I going to wear? Almost from the beginning, from the time I had signed up for the contest, this question had recurred as it must to every female who ever lived. And like every female who ever lived, I expected some fairy, the one assigned to those matters, to do her duty. I tiptoed into the hut and pulled my clothes out of the shiffer robe and took them back outside. I set them on the ground and looked at them. The fairy must have been otherwise occupied. All that lay there before me to choose between was my cotton dress, the one and only one I had left, now faded and threadbare, and a woolen skirt patched in many places with a ubiquitous heavy red and blue sweater. I held the dress up against my bo myself as if I didn't know. I pressed the dress close to my body and looked down, as if I didn't know from wearing it day in and day out that it was much too short. I made my decision. All at once I knew what it would feel like to stand up in the auditorium in a dress that exposed my bony knees. Half naked is what it would feel like. Oh, why hadn't I been my own good fairy and grabbed a party dress or two that morning in Vilna? The pale blue organdy. I saw the closet in my room in Vilna with my party dresses hanging together, each one a souvenir of parties and plays and concerts, each one a souvenir of laughter and wonder. I saw the white wool dress and my lacquered shoes and recalled that I had worn them to my first opera. Suddenly I heard the opening of the overture and I remembered that the first opera had been Eugene Anjan. Was this a good or a bad omen? What are you doing out here? Why are you up so early? Mother came out of the hut, combing her hair. How could Mama have forgotten? I wanted to know. Well, how could she have? Had she thought that she had been forever doomed to listen to Tatiana's dream? Once more, Mama, please listen to the poem. Just once more. My dear child, word for word, Pushkin himself never knew this poem as well as you do. Now I must get dressed and go to work. I must have looked so stricken that mother said, just once more, Esther, while I wash and dress. I trailed after her to our room. The room was too small, and mother slashing water over her face was a poor audience. I stumbled over a word, and it filled me with panic. What came next? Oh, God, this is terrible, 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 I cried. <clears throat> the more terrible it is now, the better you will be later, mother said calmly. This was a most unlikely thing for Mother, the pessimist, and the perfectionist to say. Overwrought though I was, it fascinated me. How could she say such a thing? In the theater, it is a well-known fact, Mother said, that the worse a dress rehearsal goes, the better the opening performance. True, Mother had known some famous actors and actresses in Vilna. I was willing to be convinced of that well-known fact, but by no means did it take care of Raisa Niknovna. And what about her, for goodness sake, Mother asked. If she is one of the judges, I'm finished. She hates me. Mother stopped fixing her hair. Mother was not an effusive mother, nor a demonstrative one. But the idea of anyone, the devil himself, hating her child, was too ridiculous for words. Stop being so silly, she snapped. Silly or not, I thought she really doesn't know Raisa Niknovna. None of us children had been able to find out who the judges were to be and this anonymous body had been our common bugaboo. But I felt that Raisa Niknovna was my personal enemy. I wasn't going to argue with Mother, but I hoped and prayed that Raisa Niknovna was miles and miles away from that contest, 
preferably on the other side of the Urals. One by one they left the hut, wishing me good luck, mother, then Nikolay, then Natasha, taking Katya with them to the day nursery at the factory where they worked. To them this would be just another day, hot and parched and difficult. Nothing special, nothing earth-shattering, nothing beautiful was likely to happen to them that day. But to me it might. My whole life might be changed that day. I sat down on my bed. The tension and the excitement had made me dizzy, or perhaps the hunger. When the world stopped, when the world stopped whirling, I looked at my nails. This morning I was supposed to spread a fresh layer of yellow clay on the ground in our room to make it clean. For once I wanted no telltale signs under my nails and on my knees to advertise that we had no floor. For once I would be a bad housekeeper. I washed my hands and feet, put on the skirt and sweater, <coughs> and dug out the chipped mirror Anya had passed on to me. A white face with appreciative eyes peered back at me. Not having seen myself in a mirror for a long time, I saw the face of a stranger. A fine Tatiana I'd make. To put a smile on that mournful face in the mirror, I stuck my tongue out and made devil's horns behind my head. It worked. I smiled wanly. I had let my hair grow again and pulled at it, trying to get the knots out. I yanked some hairs from my head and used them to tie my braids. It was time to go. The road to school was longer and hotter than usual. The huts were already baking in the sun, seeming to dry up before one's eyes. My sweater was drenched with perspiration, and the dust that covered my freshly washed feet had spread up over my legs and even flown up to my skirt. I went past the Barchoka, where someone was, uh, was haggling over what looked like a torn sheet. Down at the creek, I could see that a little boy waited patiently for a fish to present itself in the trickle that was all the drought had left in the waters. When I saw the blaze of white that was a school, I felt a rush of happiness that momentarily dissolved my fears. This was the morning I had been preparing for for months. In an hour, Tatiana and I would be one. I was early, the first to arrive for the contest. I couldn't decide whether to go in alone or wait for one of my friends. I went in alone, but not before brushing the dust off my skirt and pulling the sweater away from my overheated body as much as possible. The front door opened with a creak. The corridor was quiet and the floor was freshly scrubbed. In here it was cooler and I took a deep breath. I crept along the hall as if the floor were made of glass until I reached the largest classroom in the school, the one we used as an auditorium. The door was partly open and I could see the imp improvised platform and the rows of chairs. The room appeared to be empty and I went in. It was not empty. Standing at a table arranging some papers was Raiza Niknovna. Her mousy hair had been drawn back tighter than I had ever seen it. Not by so much as a raised eyebrow did she give any sign of seeing me. Pardon me, Raiza Niknovna. Two slivers of granite, gray and cold, were turned my way. Yes, what is it? Cold, cold. Why, why, I'm here for the contest. She shuffled the papers on the table. I don't recall seeing your name on any of these lists. I thought I would die right then and there. I didn't die, but I did begin to tremble. But Raiza Niknovna, don't you remember? I'm the one who's doing Tatiana's dream. Please, don't you remember? At last she found my name, obviously regretting that she had done so. Let me look at you, she said. I stood straight as a needle with my shoulders back, my head raised high, and my eyes just above Raiza Niknovna's head, avoiding her face. You cannot appear on the stage this morning, this way, not under any circumstances. Dear God, why not? Now what have I done? Look at yourself. What made you think you could go up on that stage in front of your teachers, judges, and visitors in that way? What way, please? What way, please? Without your shoes, of course. So that that's what way. So that was it. No shoes. I looked down and saw a pair of dirty feet. Where had they come from, these dirty, shoeless feet? Who owned them, anyway? I found my voice. I am so sorry, Raizek Niknovna. I completely forgot to put my shoes on. I guess the excitement of the contest. I'll run, run, right back to our house and put my shoes on. I'll be back before the contest is all over. Will that be all right with you? See that you come back on time. We shall not wait for you. And with those words, she turned away to straighten a chair that was not in need of being straightened. I ran out of the school. 
My panic was total. I had no shoes. The school shoes with which I dragged my feet out of our house in Vilna that morning had long since become too small, even for a child's feet in Siberia, and had been sold for a hunk of bread. What was I to do? I thought of borrowing a pair from a friend, but who of them owned more than one pair? Not one. If only we had not been so proud and had let Uncle Josiah someplace, somehow, he would have found a pair. My only hope was that I would find something in our hut, something belonging to Mother or to Natasha or even to Nikolay. I ran. As I ran, I held back tears of bewilderment along with the panic. Why does one need shoes to speak? And why did Raiza Niknovna hate me so much? When I reached the hut, I didn't stop to catch my breath, but immediately pulled out Mother's clothes. To my great relief, I found a pair of old felt slippers she must have picked up at the Barcholka. Clutching them to my chest, I thank God for them. I would not be barefoot. I slipped my feet in them. They were enormous, so enormous that they fell off my feet with the first step. Frantically, I searched for a piece of string, and when I found it, I ran from the hut, leaving everything topsy-turvy. With the slippers under my arm and the string clutched tightly in one fist, I raced back over the dusty road. My throat was as dry as paper, and the dust stung my eyes, but on I ran as if I were possessed. I almost collided with an old man who was walking peacefully along the road. He stared at me, a wild creature clutching slippers and swinging a clenched fist madly in the air. He shook his head from side to side when I called out, Excuse me, Dadushka. This poor Polish kid has gone berserk, he seemed to think. I could scarcely breathe by the time I got back to the school. Each breath escaped with a huge, rasping noise. My shoulders heaved and my knees trembled. My braids had loosened and my hair was falling over my eyes, but I had returned. With the inside edge of my skirt, I wiped the dust from my toes and ankles and slipped my feet into the slippers. I tied them with the string and opened the door to the corridor. The string just about kept the slippers on my feet, but as I ran toward the auditorium like a deranged duck, the corridor echoed with the clap, clap, clapping of the slippers. Trying to keep the door from squeaking, I slid into the auditorium. The door did squeak, and all eyes turned toward me, except those of a boy who was on the stage reciting an ode to Stalin in a high, nasal voice. Raiza and Iknovna sat on to, next to the table looking at me with her eyes more like granite than ever. Oh, so you're back, she whispered, somehow making a whisper sound like a snarl. Walk over. She started to point to the other side of the table. Then she saw the slippers. Is that what you call? My heart stopped beating for one second. Raiza Niknovna looked up from the slippers. She looked at my face. You will follow Grisha. You are the last contestant. She pointed to a single empty chair, and I waddled toward it. I had barely sat down when the boy Grisha finished the ode, and Raiza Niknovna called my name. Still struggling with breath, I walked over to the stage, climbed the three steps leading to the platform. I nearly lost one slipper. Someone snickered. I reached the center of the platform. I took one last deep breath. An awesome dream. Tatiana's dreaming. I could not lift my eyes from the floor. I was too tired. The words came one after another in their proper sequence. That was all. Pushkin's poetry was gone. Nothing was left of its color, its spirit. I kept on going. Near the end, I lifted my eyes from the floor. The audience was a big gray blur. I was so tired. But in a way, a way I had not anticipated, Tatiana and I had become one. We were together in a nightmare. Floating toward me from the gray blur was the face of Raiza Niknovna, a face I had never seen before. The cold, forbidding stare was gone, and in its place there seemed to be a grudging respect and strangest of all some kindness too at last i finished what little applause there was was weak and short-lived i walked off the stage and sat down grateful for something to sit on i closed my eyes and waited for the judges to make their decision a girl named katushka won the contest was over Avoiding my friends, I walked slowly back to the hut, kicking the dust with my bare toes. I would put Mother's slippers back, and I would never tell her about the high cost of going barefoot. 
but I was determined to get myself a pair of shoes somehow, someplace. So what did she mean by the high cost of going barefoot? Was she talking about money? Or was she talking about another cost? Pride? <laughs>